Yeah, uh, welcome everybody. So before I introduce uh, our speaker, um, David, uh, just um, uh, repeating an announcement. Um, right, so just like last year, we uh, plan to have one or two um, seminars devoted to early career talks. And uh, we are still taking nominations. We haven't gotten a whole lot yet, so, so please um, let them come. Uh, but um, we should uh, we should invite the early career talks soon. Otherwise, they won't have time to prepare. So, uh, yeah, please um, nominate. Uh, we will wait. We'll wait a couple more days just to see what's coming in before we um, send out invitations. Um, and other than that, then uh, today we are very happy to have David Anderson speaking about new formulas for super polynomials via bumpless pipe dreams. Uh, please go ahead, David. Hey, uh, thanks, Anders, um, and Leonardo, and um, Rebecca, and, and Richard, if, if he's here, for organizing and for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to uh, tell uh, what I, I hope is a fairly simple story, mostly combinatorial, about formulas for Schubert polynomials, which um, this being the Schubert seminar, I, I hope um, everyone's interested in. And the, the kind of objects that are guiding us in these formulas are the bumpless pipe dreams that have gotten a lot of attention and um, um, for good reason over the last five years or so. Um, and anything that I um, could possibly lay claim to originality in this talk is, is very much joint work with Bill Fulton. And I, um, I just wanna say one of the things that I learned from working with him over the last 10, 11 years or so, is um, that even when you feel like you've proved a result, you shouldn't feel like, like you're done until it's in the simplest possible form. Um, it's really been kind of remarkable how dedicated he is to presenting things as simply as possible. And so I thank him for helping me learn that lesson, which I'm still learning. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk about bumpless pipe dreams and Schubert polynomials. I'm not going to go into all the background of the subject, uh, assuming that, like I said, you all already care. But let's start off by just saying something about what a Schubert polynomial is. They were introduced in the early 80s by Lescu and Schutzenberger. Um, the, uh, there is a little bit of confusion, I think, in the literature. The, the single ones were introduced in 1982 or so as representatives for the homology classes um, of Schubert varieties and the flag variety. Uh, curiously enough, the, the double ones came along a couple of years later. And if you look at their, their paper, it's there's no mention of cohomology at all. It's really just about interpolation. Um, and uh, it's a little unclear when the connection to equivariant cohomology and degenerate loci and, and, and geometry came about, but that was certainly in the 90s. And um, it, it, it's, it's certainly due to a number of the people that are here in this audience. I won't elaborate on that too much. Uh, we're going to be interested, we're going to take as given that we want to compute things like this and that are related to it. And uh, we're going to be interested in, in finding formulas for them. Um, okay, so the classical ones you compute like this. I mean, everyone's seen this story, I think. You, for, you, you have a formula for W0. This is the longest permutation in SN, and it's just a simple product. And then you apply divided difference dot operators to go down in Bruja order. And this inductively tells you how to compute every Schubert polynomial. Okay, so we'll see um, uh, examples, and I'm gonna break with tradition and not do the obligatory uh, S3 example. Um, but maybe you could try it as an exercise. This exercise is about to disappear, by the way. So exercise. This is a useless exercise, probably, because if you don't know what the divided difference operator is. Um, but remind yourself, if you can, the polynomials for, um, for S3. OK. Um, there's another thing you could have done, and in fact, what what this 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 is an example of 
is you could have started with any dominant permutation. And I'm going to use um, W of lambda to indicate the dominant permutation that corresponds to a uh, partition lambda. And, um, and the Schubert polynomial for that dominant permutation is again, just a, a product. And what do I mean by a dominant permutation? Well, let me do the, the simplest one I can, I can think of off the, the top of my head. That's well, something like this, maybe. If I draw the uh, Rotha diagram, so this is maybe two, three, one. This is W equals two, three, one. And here's the Rotha diagram for that. Um, the Rotha diagram of a dominant permutation should just be a, um, a partition kind of upper left justified. And that partition is the, um, is the partition lambda I'm talking about. And so for, for this example, we would see um, that the, the Schubert polynomial is just, um, in this case, would just be x1 plus y1, x2 plus y1 because those are the two boxes in that partition. Okay, so dominant permutations are very easy to write down Schubert polynomials for. And since we have a formula for that, you can apply divided difference operators to that one and get a formula for any other dom any other Schubert polynomial that lies below your given dominant one. So that's um, that's one way of computing them. And it is very much not efficient in general. Um, Certainly, if you start with the longest element and you want to compute a, a small length uh, element, it's going to take you a lot of work and a lot of divisions. So we're looking for better formulas. OK, uh, on the way to those formulas. So at the end of the talk, I'm going to come back to just ordinary, well, double Schubert polynomials. But I'm going to take a diversion through um, a recent story um, around what's known as backstable. Schubert polynomials. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about stability. Um, it's a fact that the, um, the Schubert polynomial for um, a polynomial for, for a permutation that starts off like one, two, three, four, and then does something interesting, W, I'll call it W. So this would be k equals four. So if it starts off as just the identity for so many uh, entries and then does something interesting, um, that polynomial is going to be super symmetric in both sets of variables. So what that means is it's symmetric in the x's, it's separately symmetric in the y's, and there's a further condition which is that if you set uh, x1 equal to minus y1, then both of them, sorry, then both of them um, drop out from the formula and the, it, the formula becomes independent of x1 and y1. Okay, so that's what super symmetric means. And um, because of this, there are kind of two ways to, uh, to arrive at what ends up being the same idea. And I'll, um, I'll sketch those two ways um, and give a very, very simple example of this supersymmetry property. Um, maybe too simple, but you'll see what I mean. Okay, so two paths to the same idea using this, this symmetry and stability. So the first idea is that, or the first um, path is to relabel the variables and then take the limit as k goes to infinity. So what we're gonna do, so taking this, this running example very simply, we're gonna take this polynomial. This happens to be a dominant one, uh, just one box. It's the simplest non-trivial Schubert polynomial. So it's x1 plus y1. And then we're going to uh, bump that inversion off to the right by, by uh, prepending uh, k uh, elements in order. And so we get a, a Schubert polynomial like this. So for example, this, this would really be 
like one, two, three, four, say six, five. That would be k equals four. For example. Oh, I shouldn't do that because that looks like um that looks like cycle notation, which this is not. Okay. So if you do that, then then this is the Schubert polynomial. This is just a calculation. Um, it's the sum of the first k plus one x's and the sum of the first k plus one y's. And um, this is definitely symmetric. In fact, it's symmetric in all the x's and all the y's, but let me focus on the first k for purposes of illustration here. So it's symmetric in the, the first k x's, it's symmetric in the first k y's. And if I set x1 equal to minus y1, then both of those just cancel out of the formula and, and the formula becomes independent of that variable. So that's the supersymmetry property. There it is. Um, and then what we're gonna do, um, and I'll, I'll give credit to this idea in just a moment, is we're gonna try to just forget, you know, kind of take that supersymmetry and collect these things together and then relabel the indices so that these are back to one. And that means I'm gonna subtract K from everything. And now I'm going to get negative variables. So we're going to relabel re those indices, and and also take a limit as k goes to infinity. So here I've relabeled those indices, but now I'm also taking k to infinity. So this is going to be a series going off to negative infinity, and then I've got my x1 still hanging around. And likewise, this is a series going off to negative infinity, with my y1 hanging around. And these are um, this construction produces what's called backstable Schubert polynomials. And my understanding is that, and, uh, is that this, this kind of idea um, was um, something that Alan Knudsen was thinking about in the early 2000s. And um, that, it had, um, that it was related to constructions that one wants to make when realizing graph Schubert varieties and, um, and their cohomology classes as Stanley symmetric functions. Um, so, so this this kind of part here is a symmetric is always going to end up being a symmetric function because of this symmetry property. Okay, and then very um, there's this so this this idea was then picked up in the uh, in the teens by uh, Lamley and Shimizono and, and their 2018 paper uh, kind of um, launched this whole um, no, uh, study of, of backstable Schubert polynomials as well as uh, the bumpless pipe dreams, which I'll get to in a moment. Okay, so that's that's one path to, to these interesting objects. Um, the other path is really very much the same um, in, in some ways, but it, it uh, has a sort of different feel to it. And um, so doing the same thing as before, we've got this Schubert polynomial, um, and I've got this symmetric part. And what we're gonna do this time is collect these and just write down the symmetric function um, that they are, the super symmetric function that, that represents them. So let's do that. Um, and what this one is gonna be called is C1. So C1 in this case is gonna be the sum of the X's plus the Y's. Um, and you should think of it as being something like a mixture of elementary and complete homogeneous symmetric functions. In this case, for the degree one one, those are the same. Um, and the the pleasant thing about this, which is again, no surprise to the people that invented it from the other perspective, but it's manifestly a polynomial. And we've called these things um, enriched Schubert polynomials. Here the C in general um, is a, a churn series. So I'm going to think of it as just being a list of variables uh, where the subscript is the degree of the variable. Okay, and um, the two notions are are really, in some sense, um, equivalent via a specialization of the C series. If you specialize it to um, this infinite series, when you take the homogeneous expansions. So for example, C1 will be the sum, if, you, if we take this product, C1 will be the degree one part of this product, which is the sum of all the X's and all the Y's, just like it was before. So if you actually do this evaluation, then the, um, 
these so-called enriched polynomials are really the same as the back stable ones. And this evaluation is injective, so there's no loss of information. Uh, my understanding is that this is this kind of perspective is something that um, Anders Spook was thinking about, again, in the early 2000s, roughly. Um, I put dots here because um, Anders and his co-authors kind of from around that time um, worked out formulas which take general Schubert polynomials and collect them uh, according to grouping symmetric parts of them like this. Um, and and really, um, I also meant to say that this, this is not a, an independent path from the previous one because LLS are definitely before uh, uh, we, before our work. We're, we're just in some sense in, uh, reinterpreting it. Uh, but yeah, so this is this is a, a second path to these objects that are called backstable or enriched Jupiter polynomials. Um, uh, so a, a couple remarks about it. Um, one is that curiously, sort of after the fact, you could have um, arrived at these these polynomials um, by thinking hard about the Billy Heyman and Ikeda Mihalcha Neruse constructions of Schubert polynomials for the other classical types, um, which had this feature that the Stanley symmetric functions were encoded in them and there was a limiting process involved. Um, and so these are kind of a type A analog uh, of, of those other type polynomials. And um, so that's one, one feature of this story. Okay, so at, at, Alan agrees that, that he was thinking about that too. Okay, um, so this is a, a strict generalization or extension of the lascaux schutzenberger story. Um, if you specialize, so I'm gonna write one because I'm specializing all of the other C variables to zero, then you end up with the lascaux schutzenberger polynomial. And I'm, I'm using this convention so everything is positive, this negative one. Um, if you go the other way and specialize the X and Y variables both to zero, um, you get the Stanley symmetric function in, uh, in the C variables. And here we're, we're thinking of the C variables um, maybe as the complete homogeneous symmetric functions, um, identifying the symmetric function ring with just a polynomial ring in, in C variables. Um, so about that identification, so far I've been a little agnostic about how that goes, and I'll continue to be. Um, but I do want to say something, which is that these polynomials are manifestly polynomials when written this way. And um, uh, and they, they, they involve three sets of variables. So the Cs are these um, positive degree um, um, uh, uh, variables. Uh, the X's and Y's are all of degree, uh, let's say cohomological degree one, maybe maybe complex degree one. Um, if you wanted to do actual singular cohomology, they should have degree two, but let's not worry about that. Um, so, but there's, there's Z many of them in both of them. So we're gonna allow negative indices, um, although we won't see them in too many examples. Um, so there are polynomials, and I'm, I'm here I'm identifying uh, the polynomial ring in the Cs with the symmetric function ring. Um, like I said, you're free to think of the Cs either as elementaries or as complete homogeneouses. Okay. Um, so a question arises, though, in this story, which is how to compute them. Um, and... The problem is that the notion of dominant, or a problem anyway, is that the notion of dominant that we started with is, is not stable. So when I was describing to you earlier um, how to compute the lascaux schutz and Berger polynomials and the way one first meets them usually via divided differences, you need to start uh, the induction with a base case that you understand. And dominant isn't stable, so you, there's no notion of, of of dominant because it's if you think about it this way, um, dominant is one three two avoiding. That's another kind of equivalent characterization of dominant. 
but is, if you see, if you have any kind of non-trivial inversion in a in a permutation, you know, here's two one. As soon as I start including, let me go ahead and write this as a permutation of um, the integers. Well, this would be zero two one negative one, you know, et cetera. I guess I can move this off. And that's a one, three, two pattern right there, right? So as soon as you include anything stable, uh, anything back stable, you're not dominant. So there's no, there's not gonna be a simple product formula um, for these things, uh, basically ever. Um, so one needs a different kind of start to the induction. Um, so we're going to uh, come up with replacements for the dominant uh, Schubert polynomials. And this is sort of the first um, place where I, I can say something that is um, an innovation that, that we're doing here. So we're going to use this. Uh, um, we're going to introduce a new ring, which I'm calling A, and it is isomorphic to the same ring that where the, the Schubert polynomials live, the symmetric function ring with extra coefficients in X and Y. And in this ring, we're gonna find um, some polynomials that will play the role of dominant. So these will be dominant polynomials. Okay, so what are the variables in this ring? The variables are, um, are gonna be a whole bunch of churn series. They're gonna be indexed by pairs of integers, positive or negative. So uh, without the superscript, these are this, just the same kinds of things as before. Each one of these pieces has degree equal to the subscript, so degree one, degree two, um, but there's many of them. And what you're gonna think is that each one of these is, some, is gonna specialize to some series that looks like this. So there's gonna be, uh, you're gonna, let the xi's go up to index p, and you're gonna let the yj's go up to index q. And thinking that way, it tells you what the relations have to be. Um, so the relations among these will be like, well, if I, if I increase the p index, then I, that means I should like be able to throw in another denominator of one minus x and p plus one, and, and likewise for the q's. So these relations, um, then cut your ring back down to size, and, it, and you end up being you end up being isomorphic to this ring. Okay, so so far not much has happened really, um, but but we'll see why it's useful to write these things down. Dave, uh, yes, Alan, um, what does one over one minus x i mean? I mean, I'm not used to having these powers get arbitrarily large. Um, it is, it's like a churn series. We're only going to, we're only going to ever extract, um, coefficients of T. Maybe you would be happier if I did this. And then you, and then for any particular T you'll extract something. Okay. And then, then I'll extract the, the coefficient of T to the K when I want CK. Does, okay. Yep. Is that good? Um, thanks. Okay. Yeah. So this is like omitting the power of T is just one of these kind of uh, turn class algebra shortcuts, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, it, um, to to clarify, it, this is always going to we're always going to only deal with homogeneous elements here, um, and that that helps. Okay. Um, so if I if I were to fix, and what we had before really was uh, C was just C zero zero. And there's nothing particularly special about zero zero. It just is a nice place to start. So I could have fixed it any other PQ, but if we fix one of them, then we end up getting an isomorphism with um, with the ring that we had before, because the relations just tell you how to relate everything else uh, in terms of polynomials. Um, So hopefully that's sort of clear. Okay, so then in this ring, uh, we can give in a partition, we can define a polynomial um, as just a determinant um, in, in these uh, kind of modified C variables.
And um, so here's kind of a side remark. The um, dominant permutations are a subset of vexillary ones. Okay, I already sort of told you that, that, that we shouldn't be thinking about dominant ones, but these ones are meant to be replacements for, for these, uh, for, for, for dominant ones. And if, if I were to set things up so that, um, the, the, so that I could find a permutation corresponding to this lambda so that this thing was dominant, then the determinant for that would look like, the determinant for the, the vexillary, um, sorry, vexillary uh, Schubert polynomials have determinantal expressions. This is what I wanted to say. And this would be that determinant. And so our idea here is basically to take that determinant, translate it into this C language, and then just declare that this polynomial is that one. Okay. So um, let me say that again. If I get rid of the C's, then, and so I, I make all the C's um, zero, then this one, this polynomial I've defined here is precisely the ordinary Lasku Schubert, uh, Lasku Schutzen double Schubert polynomial for a dominant permutation. So it's it's sort of a fun little exercise to kind of try to figure out that when you do this determinant uh, and you make all the higher C's equal to zero and you use the relations to pop out some X, X plus Y's, you end up with just something that factors into a product of X i's plus Y j's um, with the i j in the in the shape of lambda. So these these are sort of the right kind of uh, dominant versions for back stable superponents. They they do specialize in the right way. Um, right. So um, these form a basis for all polynomials as you let lambda range over all partitions um, as a, and again, as a module over uh, polynomials in X and Y, right? So th that has the right kind of cardinality, I guess, uh, is the right grading because remember lambda is symmetric functions and that has a basis over of, of polynomials indexed by partitions. So these guys are, are a basis. And um, that means that I can write any element of that ring, uh, in particular, the general uh, backstable or enriched Schubert polynomial as um, a sum um, with of these thick guys with coefficients. And so what we'd like to do is get an expression like this, a finite expression um, where we know what these coefficients are. And so the first theorem is um, is an expression uh, of that form. And it, um, so I, I should say, so I'll say what these things, what these objects are uh, probably after the break. Uh, but what we have is a bumpless pipe dream, that's BPD, a bumpless pipe dream formula for these coefficients. So we can express any um, enriched Schubert polynomial, excuse me, um, as a finite sum over uh, partitions where the coefficients are again finite sums of um, bumpless pipe dreams and, um, um, in the kind of the usual way. And I'll explain what the usual way is in just a moment. So, so these are bumpless pipe dreams. They were, uh, as far as I can tell, introduced by Lamley Shimizono. Um, they're they're um, uh, connection to uh, Schubert polynomials was explained uh, kind of concisely and clearly by Anna Weigand. Um, their kind of combinatorics and role in Schubert calculus um, has been investigated a lot by a lot of people, um, but I'll mention Dao Ji Wang. And, um, and, and also uh, there's a, a wonderful paper by Fan Guo and Sun who, um, who kind of introduced this notion of dominant transition, which I'll, I'll say something 
briefly about uh, after the break. Um, so this seems like a good place to, to stop uh, for, for five minutes or so. All right, David, thanks very much for the first half. And any questions?